Good morning, my name is Robert and today I'm going to take you through what's new and interesting in the ASP.NET world. This video is the same talk I gave at the recent Microsoft Tech Days conference. So if you were at that conference, I was really glad with the feedback I got from the sessions I gave there, but you have already seen this. If you couldn't make it to Microsoft uh, Tech Days in Africa, then this will be some, I hope, some amazing content for you. Before I begin, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Robert and I'm just your stereotypical geek. I tweet a ridiculous amount at R. McLean on Twitter and sometimes write some clever things on my website at SADev. I'm a member of the developer user group in South Africa as well as an active member of the ALM ranges where I help Microsoft ship products. So what are we going to see today? What is this talk all about? This talk is a very difficult talk for me to give because ASP.NET uh, and web development in general with Microsoft Technologies is moving at such a cadence, at such a rate that it is very difficult to do everything in a one hour session. So in this talk, I will be focusing on a couple of areas. One, I want to talk about sort of generalistic themes, things I think that are important in the way you uh, understand ASP.NET, understand where it's come from, where it's going, things like that. I think it's also important that I show you things that are not just flashy new things you can use on make new websites, but important things you can use to improve your current websites because a lot of the time we are working on existing sites and we want to be able to adopt new technologies. Lastly, I want to just give you some cool demos on reasons why Visual Studio is the best IDE and potentially use that to laugh at other people. So, uh, let's have a look at some of these themes to start off with. And the first is cadence, and this is around cadence is how often Visual Studio ships. So if we look back in time, to all the way back to Visual Studio 2008, it shipped in November 2007. And it took nine months to release the first service pack. Now that service pack only had patches, and bug fixes in it. It contained no new functionality. Nine months for bug fixes. That's massively long. 20 months though to get the next release out. You know, we're at that point we're almost at 30 months between releases. You know, that's just shy of three years. That's huge. I mean, the whole world, what technologies are important between 2008 and 2010 is so vastly different. How can you keep up? How can you say this is the best of breed? a year almost to ship another service pack with just bug fixes. And another 17 months after that, after the service pack, to ship the next version of Visual Studio. And Visual Studio 2012 is an amazing release. But to only ship three major releases in almost five years is ridiculous. Um, the world has moved on. Web technologies have moved on. I think we definitely could see with people's choices of things, the rise of other text editors, the rise of other technologies that were used to build websites in that time where Microsoft was just falling behind because they couldn't keep up to date. And this is a major, major issue with web technologies more than anything else because it moves so fast. Um, and with Visual Studio 2012, this changed. So update one came out just three months after the original release. And not only did this contain a number of bug fixes, as the service packs used to do, it also included new functionality. A mere five months after that, update two. Now update two contained even more functionality. For me, one of my favorite features of Visual Studio is this, this technology in it called Light Switch. They included an entire new version of the product there. So where Light Switch has uh, had got a release with 2012 RTM, it got a second release with update two. That's how fast they moved on that team. And update three, just two months after that with more functionality, more new features. And now, just four months after that, we got Visual Studio 2013. So just over a year to get a whole new release from scenarios where we were looking at at least two years almost to get releases. This is a major improvement and this constant update, this constant new functionality and improvements to the product the whole time really do help. So let's talk about some other sources of cadence that 
uh, you can find. Not only is this stuff just linked to big Visual Studio releases, that the only time that we can get new ASP.NET functionality is when Visual Studio updates, and that only updates when we get a new .NET version. You know, there are other ways that teams are now embracing this cadence and improving their performance. So with the Visual Studio 2012 life cycle, we got 10 major, 10 updates from other teams. So the ASP.NET team shipped an update for their tooling. SQL team shipped an update for their tooling. And when I say an update, I'm not talking about an individual release. I'm saying they, here is an update to SQL tooling, and they may have had multiple releases in that. So these are 10 teams that have gotten together and sat and figured out their stuff and shipped big updates. That included not just bug fixes, but new functionality again. In addition, for Visual Studio 2012, we got over 20 extensions from Microsoft. Now, extensions are lightweight additions to Visual Studio, and they can improve the product in dramatic ways. But because they're lightweight and they don't require lower-level plumbing improvements or changes that into the infrastructure that's behind everything, like .NET, they're very easy to get out and keep up to date. So that Microsoft has been shipping a lot of these to improve the product as well. In my opinion, the things that are important that if you have Visual Studio 2012 that you should have installed on your machine, particularly as an ASP.NET developer, the ASP.NET and Web Tools 2012.2 release. Now that requires you install update 2, uh, and that will give you not only new functionality in terms of tooling, it will give you new functionality in the ASP.NET runtime, which is great. As you probably use Git, install the Git provider. Now, the Git provider is fully built into 2013 already, but if you have 2012, you can just download and install it and have a really great Git experience within Visual Studio. The SQL team in shipped the, both the SQL Server data tools and the SQL Server data tools for BI updates, uh, extensions. These went and improved the product so that you could do things like reporting services, analysis services, integration services in Visual Studio 2012. So you don't have this problem of, well, I have to keep an old version of Visual Studio around so I can work with SQL anymore. I can work with the best one. And most importantly, and one that I'm going to use a lot today, is Web Essentials. As the name says, it's essential. This includes many, many, many cool features. Now, this is available for 2012, but there's also a 20, Visual Studio 2013 release of this as well. This was originally created by Mads, who works on the ASP.NET team. And Mads uh, then took this to the team and showed it to them, and it's now been adopted as the ASP.NET team's sort of experimentation and playground area. So a lot of things go into this before they go into the actual product. We saw that with Less. We saw that with TypeScript, where you know, they were first, the tooling support for those were first in Web Essentials, and then they became features of the actual product. So much so like TypeScript and Less are just part of the product now. So if you really want to be on the, with the best tooling and be the most up to date, you grab Web Essentials. All of this just culminates in this idea that we can get lots of things really often. Now, you might be wondering, okay, well, we get all this new functionality a lot of the time. How do we make sure that our apps don't break? How do we make sure things just keep working? So the fir we have to talk about compatibility around that. Since Visual Studio 2010 Service Pack 1, there has been both forwards and backwards project compatibility. So if you have a ASP.NET website built in 2010 Service Pack 1, you can open it up in 2012 or 2013, work on it, save it, and then go back to 2010 and open it up there. There's no more of this breaking changes that when you open up a new version, it doesn't upgrade, and then you can't open up in older versions. It's very, very cool. And the same is true for uh, projects you create in newer versions can be opened up in older versions. Now, that's not true for every template. It's obviously, Windows 8 applications that were introduced in Visual Studio 2012, they can't be opened up in 2010 because there is no support for those in the product. But if, you know, something like WPF, which is across all of them, or ASP.NET, which is across all of them, they can definitely work across all of them and have that forwards and backwards compatibility. And I think it kind of goes without saying because it's just become accepted part of Visual Studio. But Visual Studio does support multiple frameworks. With 2013, we support six versions of the .NET framework, which is massive. And what that means is if you have a team that's working on Visual Studio 2010, so it's pack one with .NET 3.0, and you're building websites there, 
you can just go and open it up in 2013 and take advantage of a lot of the tooling improvements, a lot of the IDE improvements, but still remain on .NET 3.0 and still remain, still have support for the rest of the team working with Visual Studio 2010 Service Pack 1. Not everybody in your team has to upgrade. And so it really can make it a lot easier to upgrade uh, your team. You can do a piecemeal, you can test things out, you can understand what's going on the whole time. So I think this is a very, very cool release. In terms of Visual Studio 2013 in particular, we have to say goodbye to some features. They have been removed, and you might say, well, that's a problem. But in some cases, this actually may be a good thing. Uh, so the first one is front page extensions. Um, this allows you to publish two servers using the front page extension technology. I haven't seen anyone use this in a decade. So I don't think that matters too much, but maybe you have a really old workflow, and you're working with really old servers, then that could be a problem for you. Uh, thankfully, there are better alternatives in the product now. Uh, besides, you know, legacy things like FTP, we also have web deploy, which I'll show you a bit later on. We also have to say goodbye to the Cassini web server, or as it was known, the Visual Studio web development server, or something silly like that. It's a uh, custom-built web server that could run ASP.NET, and it's been around for a long time, and you may be used to it being able to start up and shut down. Um, what was nice with this is it, it just started when needed and shut down when it didn't, as opposed to ASP, uh, as opposed to IIS, which ran the whole time. Now, Microsoft addressed this a while ago with IIS Express, which is a version of IIS, IIS that's based on the same code base, except with IIS Express, it doesn't run as a service. It runs only when needed. So it'll start and shut down only when needed, which is very cool. So you kind of get the same performance benefits from that you would with the Cassini web server, but because it's the same code base, everything works the way you would expect it to work when you actually go to production and you're going to start using IIS. And you can make use of many of the same functionality and modules and things like that we have for IIS. So I actually think both of these going away is actually a very good thing, but you may run into some issues if you upgrade and you're dependent on either one. Being an hour-long talk, there is just way too much to sort of fit in, and a bunch of things don't make the cut for a talk like this. Um, I have to kind of weigh up, you know, what things are, are interesting to show, what things work well to show on, when I'm doing a talk, and some things just don't work well, some things aren't that just interesting to show, they're kind of boring. Um, or some things just take a long time to explain. We could go, some of these things I'm gonna talk about now just are hour long talks in themselves just to get to the starting point. So unfortunately, they don't make the cut, but I really want to take time just to call them out because I think they're important. I think they deserve your time as well after this talk for you to go and look at them. First is edit and continue for x64. So we've had edit and continue for x86 for a number of releases. And this is really great that you can, while your app or website's running, you can edit the files and it'll just update. And now if you're building stuff for x64, that's very cool. I'm gonna show you something called browser link a bit later on. And I want you to, when I show you that, think about how edit and continue can help with that scenario as well, which is really, really cool. Cloud-based load testing is another great feature. Once again, this is one of these things that's kind of complicated to demo. But the idea here of using the cloud-based load testing f features from Team Foundation Service in the cloud, that will, instead of you having to rely on just your machine generating load to a test server or setting up lab management to generate load to a test server, you can get a scalable solution from Microsoft where you say, this is my test server, with my website, please run load against it. And this is what I want you to do. Click on these links, do this, randomize the forms, randomize the parts, etc. And because it's cloud-based, you can scale it up, scale it down as needed. And so it can be very cost-effective because you're not you're running this all the time. You're only running when you need it, and you're only running the scale that you need. So instead of having to go out and buy 50,000 machines to test 50,000 machines hitting a, a single server, here you can scale up to 50,000 machines and then turn it back down to nothing when you don't need it. So very, very cool feature for ASP.NET developers in my mind. ASP.NET is also just faster. Um, you know, if you just take ASP.NET 4.5 and you install it on your machine, if any of your .NET 4 apps will just continue to run, okay? And they will continue to run with a 35% improvement. Now that 35% improvement comes with no compilation. So just .NET 4 websites, get on average a 35% improvement because 
of all that stuff that's installed and improves the underlying system. Now, if you go and recompile your app and you go and make use of some of the new functionality that exists within ASP.NET, you can get even better performance improvements. Really, ASP.NET is getting faster and faster every single release. One of the things I'm going to talk about is the one ASP.NET theme. Now, this one ASP.NET theme is a very big theme and it's a very vital in terms of uh, how ASP.NET has changed over the years. And part of that is a whole new identity model, the way we do authentication authorization. Now, we've had uh, simple authentication before and we've had authorization manager before. This, we have a new one that's come in. And this one is, I think, a bit of a mixed bag. Some of it is better, some of it is worse, some of it is on par. Uh, the better stuff, it is definitely better architected, is better structured, it is better designed. It is, in many ways, a more modern approach to this. It's something where you can easily say, well, I'm not necessarily going to have the stuff coming from uh, a SQL database. Uh, my users aren't stored there, they're stored somewhere else and I need this to cater for it. It's on par, I think, with the current stuff where things like claims, which I think are kind of fundamental for identity nowadays, that's still an opt-in feature rather than something being baked in. Now, once again, you may argue that that's because not everybody needs claims. I would not agree with that, but that's, you know, they haven't forced that, and it's not too difficult to add claims in as it is today with something like the authentication stack we have. In some ways it's worse. A lot of the old web forms controls for doing password reminders and things like that, they have all fallen away and you kind of have to build that yourself. They're not particularly complicated and I think with the new architectural design it, it may actually be easier just to build it yourself but that's definitely something that we hope to see in future releases of the product where they bring in some of that pre-built functionality for common things that websites need. And lastly we're going to Owen and Katana. Now, Owen is the standard way of, of structuring uh, websites so that they can be self-hosted. Now, by self-hosted, I mean it is not run with IIS. We always think of ASP.NET having to run on top of IIS, but there are scenarios where you might want to actually completely embed your web server into an application. So you have this complete standalone system. Now, this in itself is a massive concept and it takes quite a while to go through all the details and of this, And but there are many, many good uses for it. And it's great that, uh, that ASP.NET has moved to adopt this. I will briefly touch on this a bit later and show you one example of this. I won't show you how it's all, what the code looks like, uh, mostly because I don't have the code for this, but I will show you where it's been used. And I think it's a great example of where you could potentially use this functionality. So I mentioned the one ASP.NET theme, and this is a pretty big one. This has been around for about five years in ver various forms, and I think with 2013 we finally get to the sort of culmination of the vision that was started then. And the idea is that regardless of whether you're building websites with web forms, web pages, single page applications, or MVC, or you're building services with Web API or Signal R, that the, you should have always the same set of functionality that ASP.NET isn't about these individual implementations of ASP.NET. ASP.NET is something bigger than that. Um, and there are two ideas that come to mind when I think of this. Firstly is this idea of the always wrong dialogue, that no matter what, you always are going to make the wrong choice, which is a great thing for a set of tools to give you that you're never going to be right. And I'll, talk, I'll show you that in a moment. The second thing, for me, and probably a bit more fundamental to this idea, is that you choose what you want based on architecture, not by features. So if, uh, the common example that people refer to here is just something like pretty URLs. So with MVC, we've always had really pretty URLs because we've had things like routing and uh, th that sort of technology. With web forms, though, we haven't because we've always had these page-based system. Now, what they've done with ASP.NET is to take that and move that down, take all that content and move it down into the underlying ASP.NET functionality. So now you can have routing and pretty URLs with web forms because it's just standard functionality. Same with identity. Identity is not something that sits up in an individual area. It's a common feature. So that idea of I want to build something, I'm going to choose what I want based on the architecture I'm trying to get to, 
not the feature set. So I think that's a big thing. But let's have a look at that wrong, always wrong dialogue issue. So back in 2000 and something, uh, we had this horrible, ugly dialogue box. And here we had to make choices between ASP.NET web applications and something called ASP.NET websites. And I have no idea what the difference was. All I know is that you never did web applications. But you know, even here we had weird choices of you had, we were building a mobile thing or a smart device. There was just weird choices you had to make about how to start this. Um, and this got worse as we went along. You know, with something like 2012, when you go to web, you have to choose between web forms or MVC or dynamic data or which version of MVC. It becomes completely confusing. What happens if I want to build a web forms application and I want to plug in web API? Well, that's very difficult because web forms application doesn't set itself up to be able to support many of the functions that web API needs. And so it just becomes this iffy thing. MVC got even worse in this scenario because if you chose an MVC application, you got a second dialog box where you had to make a choice between a, what template you wanted. Did you want internet or intranet? And what is the difference? I mean, how do I pick? Both of those sound kind of like the same thing to me. Um, and really what's going on here is you're choosing authentication options and not really anything else, which is kind of weird. So no matter what you did, you kind of got wrong because maybe you'd start off and you decide, well, we're going to do MVC and we're going to make this an internet application because it's going to be for our portal. So it's going to be Windows authentication. And then somewhere down the line, you need to add a grid view because you know, you want that sort of functionality. Well, now you're going to go build it or download an MVC one or pay some money rather than just use the one that ships with web forms. So you spend a lot more time than you actually really needed to. And then somebody wants, you know, this exposed on the internet with anonymous for some sections. And now you've got authentication problems. It just becomes a big nightmare. So let's have a look at how Visual Studio has stopped this. So what we'll do is we'll jump to the desktop here and we'll fire up the wrong version of Visual Studio. Let me fire up the right one here. Okay, so here we are in Visual Studio 2013. Hopefully you noticed it launched really fast there. Uh, it is much faster in loading than I've any version before it. 2012 was pretty damn quick as well. This is even more amazing. So let's go into here and we'll start off by creating a new application. We're going to go to web and now we only have one choice. We don't have multiple choices. And even this choice is a bit silly because, well, I'm building something for ASP.NET, so why is this called web? I mean, isn't that kind of part of it, ASP.NET? So we don't need that. And then application, well, I'm not even sure what that would mean. It's because it's ASP.NET. It's a thing that we're going to run on IS. Why can't we just call this ASP.NET? Um, and so we can come here and make a single choice. Now, if you do like having lots of choices, and you somehow avoid being wrong, you can go to the Visual Studio 2012 session here and select from all the old ones. But I'm going to show you how this one works. So let's go in here and we'll say OK. And now we get a choice of our starting template. And this is about what we want the pages that are created to be based on. This is not about locking us into picking a specific technology. Because no matter what you choose, you'll be able to use every technology across them. So if I chose empty, for instance, I can add MVC pages, uh, MVC views, I can add web forms, I can add anything I like. Same with web forms, I can go down here uh, and pick that or MVC and I can go and add web forms to that. It becomes very, very simple. This is about choosing your starting template, how we do some structural things about what folders and th JavaScript libraries are added in, but that's not the end. That's just here's a way to get you a little bit ahead. And if I need to add an additional functionality, well, what's great is over here, I have abilities to add in more and more pieces of functionality. I can, so I can choose web forms, I can choose web API. Uh, so if I wanted a MVC site with web forms and web API, I'd just select all of it. In terms of authentication, they've made it very clear now as well. We don't have this idea of, oh, well, what is intranet? What is internet? We just have authentication. I can come in here and pick no authentication. I could choose individual accounts where I can use local authentication, or I can use window, uh, you know, OAuth-based systems like Facebook or Twitter. And what's great with this is it's really nicely baked in that 
to the point that Facebook's one line of code change. It's really, really simple. We can use Windows authentication if you want to plug into AD or into your local accounts. Or we can use organizational accounts, which lets us plug into hosted, more cloud-based services like Windows Azure Active Directory. So this is pretty cool. So let's go with MVC, and actually we'll just set to no authentication for this demo. We'll start off with something nice and simple. We won't add in too much. And so this will start getting set up. And what I'm going to do, hopefully what you notice, uh, we we're a bit slow there. Hopefully you noticed in the bottom left-hand corner when that was happening, and you'll see it when I do it in the next one, next demos as well, that it was adding various things. Now it's adding these items to the project through NuGet. So what's great with this, for those of you who haven't seen NuGet, is I can right-click on references, say manage NuGet packages, and I can see exactly what was installed and set up. So you can see I've got lots of things in here. Things like ASP.NET MVC and ASP.NET Razor and so on. But where the NuGet really shines is the ability to go to updates and say, show me all the updates. Let's just switch to stable. And there you can see all the various things that have updated between the time the product was re released with its out the box templates and now. So if I wanted to update everything, I could go and click update all. And NuGet's a great way to get this sort of stuff. Now, with NuGet, we've got the traditional NuGet.org. We also have a new one, Microsoft and .NET, which is a curated list that Microsoft controls access into still based on the same technology, it still runs on the same systems, so uh, you can get the same experience there. But we also have the ASP.NET nightly builds. So we can go in here and say, show me all the pre-release stuff. So if I wanted to go off and see exactly what's coming down the pipeline, here is some of the sort of new stuff that's not even included in the product, that's the next release, and I can grab that stuff. So this becomes very, very easy to work with. And I'll show you how I use this just to add stuff as well a bit later on. So the new get stuff's really cool. Let's have a look at how this page looks. So we're going to hit run here in, and it will launch into the Explorer. And you should see that the site comes up nice and quickly. And it looks kind of boring. It looks like a standard welcome page. But what's really important here is that this page has been built with Bootstrap. Now Bootstrap is a CSS uh, set of styles and libraries that work together to give you a very good site. And because it's an open source thing that was originally built by Twitter, there are lots of people who understand it. You can go to web designers and say, we were using Bootstrap, and they'll understand what you're working with and be able to tailor it for you. You can also download themes, which gives you a great head start into customizing it. So if I wanted everything red, I could go find a Twitter Bootstrap red theme, and it would color everything correctly for me. Bootstrap is based on this grid layout idea, where everything is in columns of 12. So if I shrink it down, what that allows me to do is it allows me to be very responsive. So you'll note as I shrink from like a really big resolution here, as I go down the margins and padding changes and I go lower down, it now starts to stack. And I go lower down the menu up here at the top, that starts to shrink into a menu button. And we can keep it going lower and lower and things realign to the point it gets really small on a really small device now and it starts to shrink the content for us so regardless of what you're using you can really get good sort of ui out of twitter bootstrap and as i said it's the sort of the best of the open source world and that's a theme that you'll see a lot now with asp.net rather than relying on well it has to be built at microsoft and this is going to be our css library and you have to figure it out they are adopting whoever has the best thing. So we have things like Twitter Bootstrap, but it's also we have things like jQuery, Modernizer, Respond. These are all the best JavaScript libraries out there. And so they have uh, their ways of offering, uh, picking the best and saying, this is what we're going to support, and it makes it very easy for you to work with that. Now, let's have a look back to Twitter Bootstrap, and I'll just give you an example of why this is such a great system. If we come into the IDE here, what you'll see is here are our three columns. Each of them has a column MD4, and the idea, as I said, is that everything adds up to 12. So we need to add this, make sure all these add up to, to 12, which 4 times 3 does. So if we want to add in another one, well, what we do is we'll select this, and I hit Control C, and I'll go down here and hit Control V, and now I need to go and change this. Now, before I do that, I want to add some, change the content so it looks different. So I'm going to use Alt 1, and hopefully what you'll note, this is a cool little selection trick. So you, hopefully everyone knows, like, you can hold click and select. Uh, nowadays, you can also hold shift and alt, and you can do block selection if you want to select like that. Uh, and that's been around since 2008, I think. Now you can also, in your 
web development go hit alt one and it expands up and alt one again and alt one again and if i need to go down it will shrink down so great way of just selecting chunks there so we're going to take that there uh, i want to insert some text now i mentioned i'm using the web essentials extension so one of the cool features from that is just this thing called lorem so i can type lorem hit tab and i get some text i could also type like lorem 10 to get like a shorter sentence there so that's pretty cool now i need to uh, rename these columns so we need to get back to 12 so we'll do column dash md dash four and we'll change that to column dash md three and what's great just as another cool little feature here if we zoom in to the state uh, to the scroll bar here you'll note i've got some colorization happening here. i've got some green going on to show me where i have added things i've got yellow little dots to show me where all the column dash md dash fours are found i've got a little blue line here to show me where my cursor is and so there's a lot of just little hints coming through into the ui now to help us navigate this feature is built into the product now if you're in 2010 or 2012 you can get the same feature from microsoft using one of those extensions i mentioned and in that extension is the productivity power tools which added this ability in so microsoft and in terms of the visual studio team is doing the same thing that the sp.net team is doing with web essentials they have a way to experiment to try and graduate good ideas from a extension mode to a actual product mode so we'll change these all to three so now three times four is 12 so everything will still be fine and we can run this again in visual into internet explorer and we will see here we've got our new column and it matches everything else so it's just if you need a responsive ui this is a great way to build that very quickly and you get this sort of good starting point going on there now you may have noticed i have a little drop down here next to where it says internet explorer in visual studio and i can go select many other ways to run my site one of them that's been introduced is page inspector now page inspector runs internet explorer within visual studio so there's a way for these two environments to talk to each other. So you can see I've got the website running here. And the great thing about Page Inspector is it gives you some of the sort of browser tooling, that uh, developer tooling that you would expect. So I can see styles and so on. And I can navigate around and work in here. But it also gives us this inspect mode where I can click on a button and I can move around and it will select and show me on the right hand side exactly where that code is. Why I believe Page Inspector is very useful is that when you look at how pages are built nowadays this actual page doesn't have everything if i come up here you'll see we start off with this jumbotron if i select that let's actually select in page inspector there that's where it starts the menu that's at the top here doesn't exist in this page it comes from the layout page or the master page if you're a web forms person now that, if you are taking somebody else's project over that can be difficult to figure out where all these pieces are coming thankfully with the inspect option if i move up to say the menu here it will take me to that page. You can see here, it's now opened up the layout page and it's now showing me this is where this feature comes from. So in terms of understanding what's going on, it becomes very, very useful. So Page Inspector is a really nice tool for doing web development where you have lots of things sort of fitting together and you kind of need to figure out where they all come from. But there's lots more in that list. If we bring this list down, you'll see I've got Google Chrome and Nightly in there. Now it's Firefox Nightly build. So Google Chrome was installed on my machine before I installed Visual Studio 2013. And so the first time I launched Visual Studio 2013, Google Chrome appeared there. S Firefox Nightly I installed after I installed Visual Studio 2013. And the next time I launched it, it just added in automatically. And that's because Visual Studio is aware of the most popular sort of browsers and will add them to this list automatically for you. So if you want to have uh, Safari or Opera or any other browser, it most likely will be automatically added there. And so you can work in the browser that you are most comfortable in. You can also go down the bottom here and get some more emulators. Now I have two interesting emulators here from a company called Electric Plum. One is an iPad emulator, one is an iPhone emulator, and you can get these for free if you install the ASP.NET Teams Web Matrix product. And this allows me to run an emulator that shows me what this stuff would look like on those devices. So let's have a look at how what we can do here. So I'm going to select, uh, we'll do the iPad for now, and then we'll do Chrome and Nightly. I can select multiple in here. I can also choose my window size. We'll do it really small and hit browse. And now it'll launch up multiple browsers.
So this is very cool in terms of sort of, I need to test my app across multiple browsers and make sure everything works. You can see exactly here in Chrome, everything's looking good. In uh, Firefox Nightly Builds looking good. And on the iPad here, it looks good. We can actually swap to the iPhone as well. And let's just switch the orientation to portrait. And so, you know, you can see easily here's all the content and how it's all sort of handled its layouts. So this is a very, very cool experience. Now, part of the problem here, when we get to this sort of experience is how do we make sure we update all of these pages? So now if I go to make a change, maybe I'm gonna use our cool edit and continue stuff here. We can go in and I'm gonna change this to editing while running. We come back here now when I hit refresh on this and then I wanna come here and hit refresh on this. Wouldn't it be good if we could just sort of automate this process, somehow make this process a bit more streamlined, somehow make this a bit easier to work with. So before I get into what the solution to that is, I'm gonna take a little detour and talk about something called Signal R. Now Signal R is a way of communicating between clients and servers, and it's a push system. So if you look at jabber.net, J-A-B-B-R.net, or shooter.signalr.net, you'll be able to grab uh, a good example of that. Jabber is a chat system, Shooter is a multiplayer game. And what's intelligent with SignalR is it's built for the web. This is not a technology like TCP IP, which is built for networks. This is a web specific technology. And so what you'll have is you'll have SignalR, it runs on top of ASP.NET, so it needs IIS, and it runs a server that you control things with. And then your it communicates to your clients using web sockets, as the preferred choice. So if you're on any good modern browser, that won't be a problem. Uh, or a server sent events if you're on any browser except IE. So this is the fallback it will do. So if no web sockets, let's go to server sent events. Okay, maybe you're on IE 8. Well, let's fall back further to forever frame. And if for some reason that's not available, it'll fall back to long polling. And so the clients can communicate with whatever they use. Now, most of the time that's going to be JavaScript because these are primary JavaScript technologies, but if you are doing something like WebSockets, you can get that into ASP, into .NET applications as well. I once built something where I had a console application on one side, which was using WebSockets to talk to a SignalR server, which was then talking to a Silverlight application on the other side and sending data between all of them. So it's definitely not just limited to that sort of space. In this case, uh, most of the time it will be a sort of JavaScript more focused thing, but you don't have to be. So. Why do I bring this up? The reason I bring this up is because Microsoft has Signal R as part of ASP.NET nowadays. And they thought like, what can we do with this? What can we do with the systems we have? What can we do with this Owen and Katana stuff we have? So the idea was, let's go and put Owen and Katana into Visual Studio. So when I'm running Visual Studio now, I actually have a Katana implementation going on. And it's hosting a Signal R server. And that signal our server, when it runs uh, Visual Studio generates my pages for me, it will go and generate out just a little bit of JavaScript. And that JavaScript allows the page to talk to Visual Studio. So I have that tight coupling now between the two. But I have it in a nice open standard. So it works across browsers. So let's go back here and let's go do this again. We'll pick all the browsers and we'll do some small resolutions here. So there is our various browsers. Let's see if we can get all of them to sit quite comfortably on the right-hand side here. I don't know why IE is not loading the theme properly. There we go, IE, thank you. And we'll just dock Visual Studio to the left-hand side here. Let me make it a little bit bigger. So now with Page Inspector, because I have Signal R running in Visual Studio and I have the code here, I could do something like this where I can say browser link. It's awesome. Now, browser link is the name of this feature in Visual Studio language. So we'll save that there. And then I come to this little button and I say refresh. And it sends that signal through Signal R through JavaScript to each of the browsers and tells each browser individually to update and do a refresh. Now, that in itself is pretty awesome. You know, that's, that's a feature that's going to save you five, 10 minutes a day on your cross browser testing and how everything works. It's a very, very cool sort of thing to have. But now if you have this connection, you can do other things. And some of the other things we show you come from the Web Essentials extension again. So the first thing is, well, if we have a way to communicate 
to the browser, can't we communicate back? Can't we send it stuff to do and get the response back into Visual Studio? So one of those interesting ideas is how do we know what's rendered? Because if you think about this, we can't check this page here to check what's rendered because this only has the content. We'd have to somehow figure out what's in the layout file. And then we may have stuff injected in through code behind or some other process. In fact, the only way to know what's really rendered is to wait until it's rendered and then query it, to use something like jQuery to query what's in the page. And this becomes useful for things like search engine optimization, where you may want to have certain tags that exist. Now, the only way to know that, if that tag exists, is once it's rendered. Because we have signal R and we have this browser link between these two environments, I can use the browser link here with the JavaScript to do a query to the what's rendered, find out if a tag is there. If the tag isn't there, tell Visual Studio. And so when I'm running browser link now, if I go to my error list, I get exactly that. You can see here, it's saying is there is no meta tag being rendered. And this is just getting surfaced back into Visual Studio. What's great with this now, I can double click that and it will insert a tag for me. In terms of how complex that is for a browser link extension, that is about three lines of JavaScript. It's really, really trivial and about 20 or 30 lines of C sharp. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it's a nice small feature and I can see lots of uses for that coming in the future. Another good example of that is to see what CSS is being used. So we can ask the browser what CSS did you load and what CSS didn't you use. So let's grab Chrome over here. Chrome has got two windows open because if we go down here, you'll see I have two instances of Chrome open. We'll just close one away. And I'm going to say start recording. And what this does is it will now start recording all the CSS on the page. So as I move around the site, it will go and figure out what is not being used. And then I can go to my error list and see exactly what CSS hasn't been used. It was sent to the browser. The browser has it available. It just was never used. And because it's not into Visual Studio, I get little cool green squigglies in here. I get green little dots on my uh, scroll bar to help me find these. It becomes very, very easy to figure out what is not being used and what is being used. Now you can see here, all of these are sort of validation things. And so none of them would have come up because I didn't hit any validation problems. So this is not necessarily something where you're going to go and remove every one of these every time. You need to figure out, well, did I hit a scenario where this would have been used? But it does help with sort of starting that discussion and that sort of process. So we have this two-way ability. What more could we do with it? Well, we could send the browser just a little bit of info about what it's rendering so that when it sends some info back, it could give us more insight. So we'll grab Firefox here, and we are going to, let's make him come to the front, switch on inspect mode. Now, inspect mode works very much like page, explore, uh, page inspector. I can hover over things in the browser now and find out exactly where it's come and I can move across multiple things and it will find it if it's in the layout file or in other places. And that is very, very cool. I can now use sort of page inspector outside of Visual Studio with my favorite browser at any resolution. For me, this is a big deal. This kind of gets rid of the need of having page inspector in the product anymore because this is so awesome on its own. But if you could sort of send data backwards and forwards, why can't we manipulate data backwards and forwards? Obviously, it's easy to send a signal to the browser and say, hey, I need you to update. But what could we do a bit more with it? Let's go grab Internet Explorer here for the last one. And we're going to switch on design mode. Now, design mode, oh, there's Internet Explorer. Uh, let's do that again. Refresh, please. That wasn't Internet Explorer. Design mode, there we go. Uh, there we go, design mode in the Internet Explorer. So. What's going on here, you'll see we get a similar sort of inspect mode experience that we had where we can hover over things. But where this gets really great is I can come here and click. And now what I want you to do is as I type here on the right hand side, because I'm going to start typing in my browser, watch what happens to the code on the left. I'm changing the code, I'm sending changes back. And then I can come in here, hit save, hit refresh, and everybody gets it. How cool is that? And this not only works with HTML, I could go back into here and let's ask it to refresh. Sometimes it, design mode doesn't kick off properly. Go up here to application name and watch what happens to the code there. I'm editing the C sharp. Very awesome. It's very, very clever. 
we have this ability to go and work in our browser, have our browser as a canvas for us to work in and have that update our code. We don't have to think about where it is in code. This really kind of gives us a design view now that we haven't really ha ever had before. This, in my mind, is amazing. This is a game changer. So hopefully you find that just as equally awesome as I do. In this first sort of demo, we start off looking at, we got Visual Studio 2013 and how awesome it is. The one ASP.NET theme coming through here that there is no more wrong dialogue that ASP.NET sites ha are now based on the Bootstrap theme. We discussed SignalR and how it's used. I showed you one example with browser link, but you can obviously use SignalR for many things on your own. And then of course we ended with how awesome browser link is. Now I mentioned earlier when talking about the one ASP.NET theme that a key thing for it is that there is no sort of feature fight anymore. That I don't have to fight between picking a technology stack because I want certain features that no matter what I choose, I should get the same features. So let's have a look at some demos for that. Uh, let's get to the desktop again and we'll clean up the desktop as we go along here. Just so we have a nice sort of experience to start with again. So we'll start a whole new project again. This time we'll do web forms just to be different and we're going to add a web API because I really want to show you that everybody has everything. And Webforms has kind of been the poor cousin of MVC for the last few years. Once again, bottom left hand corner, note that it's adding things through that NuGet-like experience. So here is everything in here, and let's just have a look at what happens. So we'll run this in Internet Explorer. Make that nice and big. And before it loads, actually one thing I want to turn on is the developer tools in Internet Explorer. I'm going to go in here with F12, tell it to run, and then I'm going to refresh. Because I want to show you just how much is going on in here. Now, you can see down here we have lots of stuff getting loaded, and it's taking a considerable amount of time and requests to do all of this. I'll come back to that in a second. I also want you to note that, look, Web Forms looks exactly like MVP. VC, same thing, it's using Twitter Bootstrap. We also have pretty URLs. I click on about and it gets a nice pretty URL. So we don't have that issue anymore of, oh, okay, well, I have to pick one or the other. I can have whatever I like. So another feature that came into MVC first was bundles. And now the idea of bundles and minification is how do we improve the performance of your website? So I have all these requests coming down and I want to sort of shrink their files to make them use as little space as possible over the wire. That helps save stuff. But also, I want to save the number of requests. I want to bundle them together and send down as few requests as possible. Now, you could turn on bundles of minification by just switching to release mode, which is how you should get your stuff in production, or by editing your web.config and setting certain values in here to turn it on. Or if you want, you can come back into here, and then you go to the right folder this time, bundle config, and we could turn it on in here. So we would type in bundle table dot enable optimizations and we'll force that on. And what you can see here is our config for bundles. So the idea is it's going to take all of this JavaScript and mash it together into one big file and then compress it to as small as possible and offer it at that URL. So then I would change my pages to use that URL instead of all of these individual ones. And the same for this JavaScript and the same for this JavaScript and the same for this JavaScript and so on. And this is all got JavaScript out the box, but if you do uh, want, you can use this with CSS just as well. So what? how much of a difference does this make? So that's what we had before. Uh, we're down, sending about 10K up. We're getting about 1.1 megs down. Afterwards, we're getting significant improvements. We're pulling down 14% less. So from 1.1 megs to less than a meg, we're sending a considerable amount less as well, you know, down to 5.8K, a massive thing. But in addition to that, we're also doing less requests. Now, I think that less requests is actually a missed opportunity for optimization a lot of the time. You can really improve the way the site feels. And what do I mean by that? So there are two parts to the request. Firstly, there's overhead. According to Google, the average HTTP overhead is in a region of 700, 800 bytes. So not only do we have 
you know, just request overheads that we say, in this case, another sort of six K of data, which is you know, pretty small, but it's still a, a, a bit of data saved. The other part of this is that the number of files a browser can download varies. Now, if you look at the HTTP standard, it's set to two, which probably made sense when they wrote it. It doesn't make sense anymore. We have much better bandwidth. Our servers are more powerful and so on. And any good modern browser is really sitting at the point of six or eight concurrent connections now. So what I mean by this, well, first thing that happens when you get your website to load is it downloads the HTML file, single request. And then it starts to parse that. And then it finds some CSS, so it'll kick off the download for the first CSS file. Then it finds a second CSS file, so it kicks off the download for that. And then it finds some JavaScript. Now it has to wait if it's set to two, because the, we have two downloads already, so now it's going to wait, and so on. When you start to uh, get to six or eight, this gets better. Now you can even see on our example there in the background, after we optimize, we still got down to third. We only got down to thirteen. Uh, we had browser link on, which would have saved us a couple more. But still, at some point, we were likely to have these things back into each other. That one or more things was going to sort of wait for itself to finish. And by bundling and minifying this, we could have made better use of that time. We make a lot better use of the six or the eight connections we have so that everything sort of loads as fast as possible. So for me, bundling minifications is a major, major way to improve the page, the page performance. Let's jump back to Visual Studio now. And what I want to do here so I want to go in and show you just some more things that kind of highlight the fact that everyone has everything. And everything I show you here will apply equally to MVC because everyone has everything. So let's go in and we will add a new item to our project. And in here, I'm going to go and grab an entity framework model. So we can get that from there. And let's go and call this board games. We'll generate that from our database and give it a moment to wake up about wanting to create a new connection. And what I'm going to do in here is type in local DB. Now this may seem like a very weird name for a SQL server. This is using a new feature that came with Visual Studio called local databases. Now this comes from the SQL team and the idea is very similar to SQL to IIS versus IIS Express where IS is a service that runs all the time, consumes memory, does all kinds of clever background processing and optimizations, and IS Express only runs when you need it to, and frees it and goes away when you don't. SQL, if you're running SQL Developer Edition or SQL Express, it runs all the time. If you're running Developer Edition, you may have lots of background maintenance tasks running, and so at some point, it's just going to decide to optimize your, and rebuild all your indexes, and it's just going to slow your whole machine down, and you don't really have good insights to that because you're doing development, not managing a SQL server. Well, local DB is the answer to that. It's a SQL server that runs only when you need it. So it's not consuming memory or CPU when it's not running and it will get started and shut down as needed. And so there is a bit of lag. You can see that bit of lag as it loaded there because it actually has to start the whole server and get everything ready. Um, and that's about the worst of the problems you can expect with it. So we'll connect to my board games database. And in here, we will select the table I want to bring across. We'll hit finish, and that will now go and create the table for us. Okay, and here we've got our cool diagram that's been created. Let's close all of that. But what's really great with the entity framework stuff that we have now is that everything here is generated with T4 templates. So here is the code that was generated, and maybe I don't like the way this code has been generated. I can go to this T4 template and edit this, and it will change what generates here. So it becomes very easy to work with that. So now I have these models with my database. Uh, let's go and render that on the screen. So we will come into here, and we'll just get rid of all of this content, and I'm going to drop in a grid view using snippets. Now, some sort of great thing, uh, that's been added to ASP.NET, in this case into web forms, to allow us to quickly create content. So I'm going to punch in that I want to be able to sort this stuff, and now I need to tell it where to get the data. And if you're like me, who sits in the MVC world all the time, you're going to go, oh, here comes the eventing model. In fact, 
you know, I can foresee it because we have the eventing icon there. And it's all going to be this tightly bound uh, system where everything is sort of stuck together between the code. Let's have a look at what it created. If we go and look at the code for that method, we don't have an event. In fact, we have something that looks normal. It returns a nice standard thing, iQueryable. It doesn't take in lots of weird parameters and things I'm going to ignore. This is something that can be put anywhere and just referenced. Because what's happened is we've now got model binding with, MVC, uh, with web forms because we have model binding in MVC. So that concept's been taken out of MVC and pushed into that lower level. And we can do really cool stuff with it. So I'm going to say add in iQueryable uh, I of game. This supports generics, which is pretty cool. And here, all I have to do is just return my game. So I'm going to say return, uh, not dbnl, it should be models.boardgameentities, my games table. I have a lot in this table, so we'll just take the top 50 as queryable. There we go. And we will just tell everyone to save, and we will run. So this will now go and build everything. It'll take a moment to load, because it's got to fire everything up for local DB, do the queries, get everything ready on the screen for us. And here we go. Everything's loaded, and here is my grid. And as I said, I enabled sorting, so I should be able to click on rank. And quite quickly, it sorts it, so I get the top games, Twilight Struggle, uh, Puerto Rico, and so on at the top there. Really, really simple. So I get these really cool features that are a lot more MVC-like, or what we sort of associate with MVC, but now I get them for web forms as well. And the same is true going the other way. I would be easily able to take this grid view control, which is a really amazing piece of technology, and use it with MVC for rather easily as well. So this is very, very powerful. Lastly, before we finish off this part of the demo, uh, one of the things I did at the start was to make sure we had web API support enabled. So now I can easily go and add in things. And so to do that, I'm going to use the new scaffold option. Now scaffolding allows us to generate uh, chunks of code automatically. And behind the scenes, this is all powered by T4 templates. So I'm going to say here, web API controller, hit add. Uh, we'll call this the games controller, make everything asynchronous. I'm going to select my model and my data class and click add. And this will now go and make the changes to the web.config, to the global.asix, to uh, everything that's needed in terms of references, and also create the code that I need for this to work for my actual web API controller. Now, the web API controller is very similar to a MVC controller. So there's a lot of similar plumbing that's needed across those. Okay. So we've got some readme text there, but here's our controller that we care about. And you can see in here, I have now built a RESTful system for my application. So I could be able to call this odata slash games and get, the ga get all the games or pass in a parameter and get the game with that primary key. I can do updates with put and patch. I can do inserts with post. And down here, I can do deletes with the delete HTTP method. So very easy for me to go and create now a API for my web form applications. And this works just as well with MVC. Very easy to build this sort of stuff. So for me, this works really, really well in terms of kind of everybody gets everything. And everything I've shown you that I've done with web API, just uh, with web API and with web forms works with MVC just as well. So let's jump back here to the slides, and we'll jump through this again. So in that demo, hopefully what, I, what you take away from that is that everybody has everything. There's no reason to pick uh, technologies based on feature sets. And this is great if you have existing applications, because that means you have everything now at your disposal. If you're uh, currently working on web forms, you get everything that you need. We looked at balance of verification, how that can improve your performance. We discussed local DB briefly as well, and why that can really help your development experience as well. I showed off scaffolding and how that can make create websites very easily. We also looked at model binding for waveforms just briefly and how that can make a web form code just that much neater and cleaner. We also looked at web API and just how easy it is to create restful APIs for your applications. So as we get into the last part of this talk, I want to kind of try to prove to you that Visual Studio is the best IDE out there for web developers. Now, I'm not just talking for ASP.NET people, I mean for everyone, regardless of what you're using. So if we come into here, uh, let's start off by creating a new project. Now, I'm going to show you some stuff here with this, and we're going to start off with a 
empty web application. And we're going to add nothing to that at all. So this will be really quick to create. And the first thing I'm going to do in this is add jQuery. So we'll go online, we'll wait for it to load, and then I'll add jQuery into this. Now, this is just a subset of a bigger talk I've done around the same uh, concept. And you'll be able to click the link here on YouTube in the top right-hand corner or in the description below that will take you to this longer talk, which contains a whole bunch of additional demos around this. Um, but this should give you a flavor for that sort of talk. So let's have a look in here. I'm going to say add new folder, in this case assets, and that's because I have a bunch of pre-built assets that I want to use. So I'm going to drag in a bunch of them. And they're on my desktop here, and we'll drag in th these three files. One is a CSS file, and two are images. And they just help us there in not having to spend too much time building too many things. And now we'll just add in a default page, and we'll make sure that's set as the start page. Now, what I want to do on this page is just bring in my CSS, make sure that it uses it. So I'll just drag that in. And note that Visual Studio has been clever here. Because I dragged in a CSS file, it's gone and added it correctly as a CSS file. When I do this again with an image in a moment, or towards the end of the demo when I do it with JavaScript files, you'll note it does the correct thing. So it just makes it easier to work with. Now, I can use snippets in HTML as well. So I can hit Control Space here. You'll see you get various snippets. I do have a div snippet available. So I can hit div and it'll, uh, type div and hit tab, and it will complete the div for me, which is great. But it's not maybe the best way to think about things. Now, as a developer, as a web developer now, there's kind of all think in CSS selectors. Obviously, if you work in CSS, that makes sense. However, if you're working with JavaScript, well, you probably work in jQuery, and you use CSS selectors there as well to do everything. Why can't we just use CSS selectors with our HTML? And so there are ways to do this. There's a thing called Emmet, or Zen coding, as it was previously known, that allows us to describe HTML in terms of CSS selectors. And so if I wanted a div with a class of poster, well, that's the CSS selector I'd use. Now with uh, Zen coding support, I can hit tab and it will generate that for me. We can, let's undo that. If I wanted to have a child item on the CSS, well, I go angle brackets and I can go div uh, logo and there I can get that. And once again, we can keep going with this to go and create more content. And we can put in other tags. Now, once we can also do some specific Zen coding specific uh, features like these curly braces. So I can say I, and now I want to put in a heart. And we'll make use of another cool Visual Studio feature here, which is anytime you type an ampersand, you get a cool little drop down of all these little magic symbols that they have. And not only does it have what they are, but if we find one in here, there we go, there's hearts. It actually shows you what it'll look like. So I can just easily select that. It's a small feature. It's not one you're going to use every day. But when you do need one of these symbols, it will make your life that much easier. So let's put this in. And come back here. Tab. And we create a whole bunch of content there. Very, very cool way. And this Zen coding stuff can go much further. I mean, I can do stuff with like unordered list with list item in there times five because I want in each list item. I want five list items. And then remember that lorem ipsum trick we did earlier, lorem tab. You know, you can do lots of cool tricks with this. Um, I'm only scratching the surface for this because we don't have too much time. Let's go drag in the logo here. And because I am a bit pressed for time, I don't have as much time as I'd like. I'm just going to put in a footer there so that we get our page all ready. So at this point, it should actually look like something. We should be able to run this. And we do get our page looking quite nice here. Now, I want to make this improve this a bit more. I want this to look a bit more po like a poster. And I want to really highlight what's going on here. You know, this part here, this should really light up. And, you know, maybe we can even have this flicker on and off to uh, show you, you know, that it's important. So let's go into the CSS and start to play around here. So we'll start off with just the most obvious one that we have color pickers, or color swatches now in Visual Studio. So it shows me exactly what color I'm using. If I click on that, it gives me a little picker. And what's great with this color picker is it's broken two sections. So this first section here 
This is the CSS colors it's found in the document. This is the purple that I'm using. This is the off-white I'm using and so on. So, because often you're gonna reuse colors, so this makes it easy to find the same colors and use them over and over again. And then we have a standard set of colors here. You can see it sort of goes into that rainbow color thing. We can also click this and click the drop down and get a full color picker. And if we want to add opacity, and you'll see it switched from, RG, uh, from hex color to uh, RGBA. And if I move it back, it switches back to hex. Now that's because Visual Studio is being clever about remembering what I started with. If I started with RGBA, adding opacity won't uh, removing opacity won't move it to hex. It will stay with RGBA or RGB if I'm using that. So that's very, very useful. I get tooltips for uh, my fonts. Once again, small thing, makes your life a little bit easier. You can see the same sort of stuff when I go to things like margins and it'll tell me what's going on here. So we get this kind of cool stuff that's going on the whole time in our CSS. Next thing I want to do here is go and sort of make that post look a bit more poster. So I'm going to insert a transformation and this, I get snippet support in CSS now. And so we'll go down here and I can rotate and I, you can see I'm getting full IntelliSense with my uh, features here. So we'll go five degrees for that and hit enter. There we go. And note that it's gone and updated to all of the other ones there. And there's a slight sort of color difference to show me uh, these are browser specific implementations. What's great is I can also hover over this and it'll show me which versions of which browsers these implementations are for. So the standards one is a specific set of uh, versions. Right, so we have all of those set up quite nicely on there. Everything is uh, should look pretty cool. Now let's come down here to this image. And with this image here, we can go to it, we can hit control dot, and we can say embed it. And this will take the image and shove it into the page. And now it doesn't have to download a separate file, which is pretty cool. And includes a fallback version for older versions of Internet Explorer. I can hover over these and also see exactly what they look like. So it looks really, really cool there. So I have all of that set up in it. So that gets our CSS kind of like nicely done. And we could now go and relook our website if we wanted. Now, I don't normally use CSS this way. I actually don't use CSS at all. I'm going to copy all this and delete my CSS. The way I do CSS nowadays is with less. Now, I mentioned early on that we have full less support within Visual Studio. So I can go in here and paste less on the left-hand side and get CSS on the right-hand side. Now, less is a language that's based on CSS. So you can see all our existing CSS works, but it gets processed and can do cool tricks with it. So just as a way of one tiny example, and it's just a very trivial one, is I can type in something like Visual Studio Purple as a variable name. If I hit save now, you'll see the processor here will freak out, and I will get very good error information in here. But what I can do with this is I can go up here, paste this in. We'll copy that into there, and I should have had an at in it. And if we go lower down, we'll find the other one. We'll change both of them. And now I have a single place to do this because you'll see it takes that and when it renders the CSS on the other side here, it puts them both here. So if I change this here, let's click that little swatch again, come on. And we change it to red. If I hit save, both of them turn to red. And if I undo it, it goes back to purple. It gives me a nice sort of way of doing it. You can do functions, you can do uh, maps, you can do all kinds of things with, with less. It's, it's really a kind of programming language for CSS. What's great with when we do this, obviously it's rendering, the, we have the less we're typing, it's rendering the CSS, so it creates the CSS file for us, but also a minified version of our CSS. So we can go into our page here and easily just swap out the CSS we had there with the minified version, so we're sending as little down through the wire as possible, which is very, very cool. So for the last part here, I just want to go in and I want to go and make sure that this guy flashes on and off. We'll do that sort of blink tag that was very cool for a long time until rounds of people took it out. And so we'll write a bit of JavaScript for that. Now we have full support for CoffeeScript as well as for TypeScript out of the box. Uh, let's call this Blinky. And in now I'm into my JavaScript editor. If I hit dollar because I want to work with jQuery, well, I don't get any IntelliSense for that. But I can augment that now with Visual Studio. I can just actually drag things on. and You'll see it adds this little comment and now if I go dollar dot, uh, dollar open parentheses, I get IntelliSense going on. So this IntelliSense will show me exactly what's going on with the IDE, uh, with it, and it's reading it from the JavaScript. Now jQuery in this case is augmented. We have the J JavaScript here, but it's also got an augmented one that gives you a bit more insight to it. 
Uh, you'll see when we do it with Blinky that even without that, it will still figure it out. So what I want to do here is I'm going to build a jQuery plugin, which is pretty cool. So we'll do undefined as this, and we'll pass in jQuery into our plugin, you know, into our namespace that we set up. And because we have our IntelliSense, now I can start typing all the jQuery-like things. Let's call this method Blinky as well, function. And because it's a jQuery plugin, we should always return this so it's chainable. And so now I need to toggle something that make it blink. So I might decide at this point to write a function called toggle and with the name tar with a parameter target. And that makes sense to me, but when you look at this in a couple months time, you're like, oh, what is that? Like, what is toggles? What am I toggling? Am I toggling visibility? Am I toggling font sizes? Am I toggling a checkbox check state? I don't know. So thankfully, we can go in here and insert comments. So we can insert an XML comment for a description. You know, toggles the visibility, the target. And what's great with that is if I come down here, I can type toggle, open brackets, and you'll see I actually do get my little tooltip there of what is going on. Now, I'm not getting in any IntelliSense for target here uh, because more than there is a variable. But I can go and fix it. I can actually go in here and say XML comments, parameters, select the name uh, that will be target, and specify the type. So what, we'll just hit enter, and now if I go back here, you'll note that it actually gives me some more IntelliSense for that, which is pretty cool. But this extends a bit further than that. I can go up here, and if I type target dot, it gives me IntelliSense for a string type. So I've got blink and bold. If I change this to a number, I won't have them anymore. Now, nothing says I can't call blink here. I mean, it's JavaScript. It's dynamic. I can do these things. I can mess with it, and I can treat it as a string. But this is just to give you IntelliSense to make your job as a developer a bit easier. In this case, what I'm going to do is I actually just want to call jQuery. I want to call this as a jQuery object and get access to a bunch of jQuery methods. And once again, I'm not actually changing what's happening here. I'm just making it easier in terms of IntelliSense, in terms of my development experience. So now all I need to do is call uh, this. So we'll call, use the setInterval method to call that every half a second. So that's pretty cool. Well, let's go to our page and add this in. So we'll drag in the minified jQuery because we want to be clever with our space usage. And we want to drag in our Blinky. Right, so we drag in Blinky. And now it would be great to you know, have this minified and use the bundling stuff. Now, I don't have all the ASP.NET functionality installed on this. So I can't go and use bundles and minification. What I can do, though, is I can right click on my JavaScript and say Web Essentials and minify. And this will create both the minified version as well as the map that is used for debugging purposes. And what's great with this is as I update this file, it will update both of these as well. So I could go back to my page and drag in my minified version. And that sort of helps with the minification. But what about for bundling? Can't we do something with this as well? So I can select multiple JavaScript files, right click Web Essentials, and say create JavaScript bundle file. Now, you, hopefully you notice that I also do have options for CSS bundles and minifying of CSS. So let's call this bundle one. And what this will do is it's going to take both these JavaScript files I've asked it to, mash them together into one big JavaScript file, which we'll see over here. And if we open this up, you'll see it has got jQuery at the top. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom here, it will be Blinky. It creates also minified and the map for us for that, which is really cool. So if I come back to this page now, I can just drag on a single thing with my content. And then I can use a snippet to create a script tag. And I hit dollar. Note that I get IntelliSense here because it's reading that bundle. So we'll do this to have some code execute on page load. And then I can say dollar whack hash dot uh, hash uh, not hash dot reminder is what I want there. And I should be able to get Blinky there in my IntelliSense. Note, note, it found the method. It's not giving me any more IntelliSense than there is this method because I didn't augment it with additional comments. So that's pretty cool. So let's actually just have a look at how that runs. Okay. Uh, the bundle updates, obviously, because we do a build. Anytime we do a build, the bundles will update for us. So they're always kept up to date. And now we get our page, and oh, it looks like a nice little post with cool flashing animations here. So that looks pretty cool. How do we get this to production? How do we get this to QA? Well, I mentioned much earlier 
that we have this cool we have a bunch of ways we can do that we can and all of it starts with going to publish for our projects now this will apply to ASP.NET web forms, ASP.NET MVC, it applies to everyone because everyone has everything. So let's come in here, we're going to create a new profile. And from our profile options, we can choose our publish method. Now, this is where front page extensions used to exist and it's been taken out of here, but we can still publish to a file system, be that local or a network share. We can still publish to FTP or we can use web deploy. Now, I highly recommend using web deploy as your choice. Now. I'm going to do web deploy package, which will just build the package and install it on my machine. But if we use web deploy, it will do the same package build, but also copy it and it deploy it onto a server automatically for me. So I have this easy ability of sort of getting stuff out. Right, so let's select package. It's going to ask us where we want to put it. So let's go to the desktop here and we'll create a folder for it. Select that and say next. We could def give parameters about what the site name is, uh, what config we want to use, if it had any databases, we could specify all of them in there, and we hit publish. And this will now go and create that for me. If I was doing a web deploy to a server, I'd have additional parameters to add in. And this will do a build. We should actually get a prompt for our bundle to update, because remember, every time we do a build, all our bundles and minifications all get updated, so they're always up to date. And yep, see there they are. And then this will, once I get this dialog box away, come back here, I'll show you what the output is. Oop, I won't because that dropped off a parenthesis. There we go. So you see in this folder, we get a bunch of things. I'm actually going to zoom it in this way. You'll see we have a zip file. Now this zip file contains everything I need for my application to run my website. Uh, it is an absolute pigsty in there. Do not open it unless you want to be totally scarred for life. We have a parameters file. Now the parameters file for me is very cool because if I open this up, you'll see in here I have one parameter because that's the only parameter I've set. But if I config things like databases, I could have multiple in here. The use of the parameters file is that I can easily change this file without changing anything else. I don't have to do a republish. So I could take this to QA, deploy to QA, and then use the same bits but just changing this single file to deploy to a production environment. So it makes it very, very easy to work with. Uh, going back to what we get, we get a 15k batch file, which does all kinds of amazing things. And if a 15k batch file seems very unapproachable to you in terms of how to deploy this, well, there's a readme file. So it's great. So what you do is you just bundle all of this into a zip file, send it over to your server admin. He says, how do I do this? You say, there's a readme file, read, follow the instructions, and he can install this on his server and get a lot of control through the deployment process. So using web deploy makes it very easy to connect to servers and deploy functionality onto them, deploy updates to them. And if you are in a more restrictive environment, it makes it very easy to give it to somebody to do that. So let's just have a look at in terms of this last demo, hopefully what I've shown you here in terms of Visual Studio that CSS and less are an amazing experience. It really is great that we have first class support for that in the product. Zen coding allows you to just think in one way and work with that in Visual Studio. Zen coding is going to cross lots of, lots of other IDEs as well. So I know lots of people like it and want to use it in their other IDEs and kind of feel that Visual Studio not having it is, could be a problem. Well, Visual Studio has it now as well. I think I've shown you with all the cool JavaScript features that it, it really is the best IDE for JavaScript now. And web deploy really does make shipping your products very easy. It sort of can get everything set up and deployed nice and quickly. So to wrap up this talk, uh, what did we see today? You know, we start off with an overview, we looked at theme, at the generalistic themes, we looked at cadence, uh, compatibility, things like that. We spoke about most important theme in my mind, one ASP .NET. Everyone has everything, no more wrong choices. And we looked at a number of demos around that. We looked at uh, how all the new functionality with Twitter Bootstrap, the new tooling with browser link, things like that, which really does light up our lives there. As well as we looked at Web API, Signal R, uh, Webform uh, Bundle, uh, model binding, lots and lots of cool pieces there. And then we ended off with this last demo where I kind of hopefully showed you that Visual Studio is the best web development tool, that you have tons of functionality in there. So with Visual Studio, you can easily go and have stuff created and work with it, no matter what underlying technologies you're, you're using. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today. And I'd love to hear your feedback, either through comments or uh, via Twitter or my website. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you so very, very much.